Our call to worship comes to us from Psalm 23. Please pay attention to the table. Hear God's word. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And may the Lord bless the reading of his word this morning. Let's take our psalters, if you will, and stand as we sing Psalm 98b. Our scripture reading this morning comes to us not from the book of Kings, but from the book of Revelation, chapter 18, verse 21. Hear God's word. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence the great city Babylon will be thrown down and shall not be found any more. May the Lord grant us understanding of his word this morning. So, Bill, could you come and lead us in confession of sin and prayer? Bill, let's take our psalters once again. Let's turn to Psalm 89F. The kingdom described as creation. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks uh, for this day. We believe that you exist and that you reward those who diligently seek you. We give you thanks for your word. Take your word now and and uh, help us apply it to our lives. Heavenly Father, give us understanding. And I pray this all in Christ's precious name. Amen. Amen. Let's begin. Well, as we saw last time in 1 Kings 1, David is old and dying and cannot get warm, so they find a bed warmer for him in the shape of the beautiful Abishag. Uh, verses 1 through 3 of 1 Kings 1. Now, he does not know her sexually, but that is not the only thing David does not know. Adonijah, who is the eldest remaining son, attempts to seize the throne, the forbidden fruit of the kingdom and he campaigns as the son of Yahweh. We see that in verse 5 of chapter 1. This, however, belongs to Solomon, and you can see that in 1 Chronicles 22 and 1 Chronicles 28. Adonijah is both a false Adam and the serpent. He throws a feast, a table feast, in the valley of Enrogel by the stone of Zoheleth. So it's an endemic setting that he throws his feet. And it's by the stone of Zoheleth, which literally means serpent. So he's playing both a false Adam, trying to grab the forbidden fruit, as well as the serpent. Now at this point, Adonijah, through his table companionship, has very powerful allies. Joab, Shammai, son of Gera, that's not the same Shammai that's um, with David, a different Shammai. Um, Abiathar, the priest, Chief Justice John Roberts, and others are aligned with Adonijah. But he does not have access to David's bedroom, we see. But Bathsheba does, right? And Nathan the prophet plans a, a double witness, as we saw last time, involving Bathsheba and himself to convince David that Adonijah is trying to overthrow the crown prince, who was Solomon. David, being convinced, issues a, a, a public invitation to answer Adonijah's table fellowship. Table fellowship must answer table fellowship. 
and he gives instruction concerning the coronation ceremony in 1 Kings 1. And he gives prophetic instruction. I don't know if you've had a good chance to listen to uh, uh, Tim's sermon last week, but Tim does an excellent job in summary there. But David gives instruction concerning the coronation ceremony of Solomon. And he gives prophetic instruction that Solomon, as the son of Yahweh, 2 Samuel 7:14, that's what the heir of David is called. He's called the son of Yahweh. That he is to ride on David's own mule. And that's a sign that Solomon will sit in David's place. Of course, we see that in Zechariah 9, 9 as well as Matthew 21 being fulfilled in Matthew 21. Zechariah 9.9 Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion! Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem! Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt and a foal of a donkey. And I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be cut off. He shall speak peace to the nations his dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. So it's very, this passage in First King is very prophetic of the Lord Jesus Christ, the greater Solomon. And so Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, and others take Solomon on David's mill to Gihon and they anoint him as king from the horn of the oil from the tabernacle. We see that in verse 39 of chapter 1. Now it's interesting. Then it says, Then all the people went up after him, playing flutes, rejoicing with great joy. And it's very interesting in verse 40, it says, So that the earth split with their sound. They were rejoicing so that the earth split with their sound, it says, and all the people went up after him, and the people played the flutes and rejoiced with a great joy, so that the earth split with their sound. Now, any time there is a splitting of the earth, a splitting of the rocks, the person on the wrong side of the equation, which is Adonijah, should say, uh-oh, uh-oh. In Yiddish, they would say, oy vey. In Hebrew, it's yachrel, yachrel. And Adonijah, when he hears all this, and it's the sound of the earth splitting, he flees to the horn of the altar where he's pleading, don't kill me, don't kill me, don't kill me. Verse 52. The renting or the splitting open of the earth is always a sign of impending judgment. Isaiah 24, 19 says, The earth is violently broken. The earth is split open. The earth is shaken exceedingly. It's a sign of coming judgment in Isaiah there. Zechariah 14.4 In that day the Mount of Olives will what? Will be split in two. What's that portraying? It's portraying the day of the Lord. It's judgment. It's always judgment. Then, But there was always great rejoicing at the announcement of a new king. And the two kind of go hand in hand. But we can see that in Luke chapter 19, verse 37. Then, as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And what we have here... It's the same thing occurring to Solomon. There's great rejoicing. There's great rejoicing there. But there's also the splitting of the earth. There is also an, an announcement of pending judgment on those who oppose the king. So why? Why is there this, when this 
celebration that's going on. Why is there also this judgment? Well, well, peace has to be established before the kingdom can really go forth. Peace has to be established before any kingdom can go forth. And this involves violence. It involves violence. Isaiah 24, 19, that we said, the earth is violently broken, the earth is split open, the earth is shaken exceedingly. And this sets us up for chapter 2 of First Kings. And we'll see why here shortly. Now, First Kings chapter 2 consists really of, of two sections. First is, is David's final speech to Solomon, and we'll see, and we see that in verses one through nine. And then David's death in verses ten and eleven, and that comprises really the first section of, second, of First Kings two. And the second part involves the establishment of the kingdom, starting in verse twelve and ending in fulfillment in verse forty-six. We see that in verse twelve. And uh, we see the word established. Then Solomon sat on the throne of his father David, and his kingdom was firmly established. And then all the way at the end of chapter 2, So the king commanded Benaniah, the son of Jehoiada, and he went out and struck him down, and he died. Thus the kingdom was established in the hand of Solomon. So the first part of David's instructions to Solomon, and the second part is the establishment of the kingdom by Solomon. Now David's charge to Solomon is one of very famous farewell speeches in Scripture. Of course, the probably the most famous one is in John 13 through 17, and that's probably the most important. That's Jesus' instructions to his disciples. But David here in First King gives Solomon a Deuteronomy-like exhortation describing Torah in seven phases. And we see that in verse 3. Listen to the seven phases of David's instruction. And keeping charge of the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, and his testimonies, as as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. It's a Deuteronomy type um, instruction and and, a blessing. It takes us back to uh, Moses and his instructions to Joshua. Uh, David is to Solomon what Moses is to Joshua, really. Solomon is to be strong, verse 2. I go on the way way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore, and prove yourself a man, he tells Solomon. So Solomon is to be strong as Joshua was, was to be strong and courageous. So Solomon, in some respects, is the new Joshua, who is to spend the early part of his reign wiping out the Canaanites. In other words, Joab, um, Jehoiada, and so forth. So uh, Solomon is to uh, spend the early part of his reign wiping out the Canaanites that remain in David's kingdom. Bringing what? Bringing rest. Bringing rest to the land so that the sanctuary can be built for Yahweh. And that's part of David's instruction in verses 5 through 9. In fact, people kind of have this, they're reading along verses 1 through 4 and this great Deuteronomy instruction to Solomon and then they get to verse 5 and say, what? (laughs) What's with this, David? Moreover, you also know what Joab the son of Zariah did to me and what he did to the two commanders of the army of Israel, to Abner the son of Ner and Amasa the son of Jether, whom he killed 
and he shed the blood of war and the peace time and put the blood of war on his belt that was around his waist and on the sandals that were on his feet. Therefore do according to your wisdom and do not let this gray hair go down to the grave in peace. And then later down it says, And see, you have with you Shemaiah the son of Gera, a Benjamite from Burim, who cursed me with malicious curse in the day when I went to Manaheim. But he came down to meet me at the Jordan, and I swore to him by the Lord, saying, I will put you to death with the sword. Now, therefore, do not hold him guiltless, for you are a wise man and know what you ought to do to him. But bring his gray hair down to the grave with blood. So here we have this instruction from David, and the first part is just tremendous. It's a sevenfold Deuteronomy like like instruction to Solomon, just like Moses is is to uh, Joshua. And then the last uh, half of David's instructions are smite the enemies down, smite my enemies down, take them to the grave, take them to the grave. But people can't quite get their hands around this. Uh, Solomon is the you know he's the king of peace. He's going to bring in peace and rest. So why that? Well, the second section of Kings 2 begins in verse 12 with Solomon establishing his kingdom. And we have read that. Then Solomon sat on the throne of his father David and his kingdom was firmly established. And the term established is used four times in in 1 Kings 2. It's used in verse 12 here. Then at the end, verses both 45 and 46 which we read 46 and then again in verse 24 where it indicates that Solomon's work sets the foundation stone of the house of Israel verse 24 now therefore as the Lord lives who has confirmed me and set me on the throne of David my father and who has established the house for me as he promised so there we have the establishment of again of the house of David so Solomon and so we have four different establishments the four corners of the earth he's going to set the foundation for the new creation for the house of Israel and Solomon establishes David's house as a new creation we just sang that in Psalm 89 let's just read that real quick Psalm 89. Listen to the creation language, but it's the new creation of the kingdom. Psalm 89, um, verses 34 through 37. My covenant I will not break, nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His seed shall endure forever. And here comes the creation language. And his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever like the moon, even like the faithful, faithful witness in the sky. There's many, many places in, in the, the Psalms that the kingdom is related in creation type language. Now many people get upset at this point because they see violence involved with the establishment of the kingdom. I mean, David wasn't allowed to build the temple because he was a man of war. He said, no, your son, who's to bring in peace, is the one to build the temple. So they get a little upset when they see violence involved in establishing and and, uh, uh, bringing peace to the kingdom. So pay close attention as to what is happening here. The psalmist says that Solomon establishes David's house as a new creation. You can find that in many places. But there is always violence involved. There's violence involved in the new creation. But there's always violence as part of creation. We don't like to think of that. But there's always violence as part of creation. Uh, Genesis. Genesis 1, 2 through 
10. And the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. It was tumultuous. Okay? Then God said, Let there be light and there was light and God saw the light, that it was good and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night so there was evening and morning. There was the first day. Then God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was also so. And God called the firmament heaven. And so the evening and the morning the second day. Then God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered in, into one place. And let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and gathering together of waters, he called seas, and God saw that it was good. And it was good. But it was very violent. It was very tumultuous. Separating. There was lightning. There was waves. Everything you can imagine. People say, well, I really would have liked to have been there to see that creation. No, you wouldn't have. Yarrah! You would, would have been afraid. Oy vey! Get me out of here. Job. 38. Verses 4 through 15. Listen to the violence of the creation. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurement? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? There's a establishment going on here. Or who laid its cornerstones? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, creation, talking about people here. Or who shut the sea with the doors? When it burst forth and issued from the womb, when I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band, when I fixed my limit for it and set bars and doors, then I said, This far you may come, but no farther. And here your proud ways must stop. Have you commanded the morning since your days begun and caused the dawn to know its place, that it might take hold of the ends of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it. There's violence going on. The wicked shaken out of it. And it takes on form like clay under a seal and stands out like a garment. From the wicked their light is withheld and the upraised, upraised arm is broken. There's violence in creation. Psalm 104, verses 5 through 9. Who laid the foundations of the earth so that it should not be moved forever? Who covered it with the deep as with a garment? The waters stood above the mountains. At your rebuke they fled, and the voice of thunder they hastened away. They went up over the mountains. They went down into the valleys of the place which you founded for them. You have set a boundary that they may not pass over, that they may not return to cover the earth. Getting rid of the enemy. He's separating here. There's violence with the creation. And so, but you might say, well, <laughs> that's true, but certainly the new creation, the new creation, certainly that was peaceful. The establishment of the new creation has to have been peaceful. Well, just read Revelation 18, 21, what you read, or Revelation 19 through 21. Revelation 19, verses 19 through 21. And then come back to me and tell me whether the establishment of the new creation, of the new heavens and the new earth, of the new kingdom was peaceful. So just as, as violence is a part of Yahweh's creative act, violence is a part of the creative act of establishing Israel as a garden land, flowing with, with milk and honey, just as Joshua's earlier violence against the Canaanites established Israel in the land. So how does Solomon establish the kingdom? 
Well, unlike Adonijah, Solomon is acting as a true Adam. He's carrying out vengeance against Adonijah, who tried to become king at the stone of the serpent. So Solomon's going to do what? He's going to slay the serpent this time, unlike the first Adam. As Solomon takes the throne of the garden of of the house of Israel, that house is threatened by the serpent Adonijah. Adonijah attempts to seize the king's bride, Abishag, in chapter 2, verses 12 through 13. We see that. Or, excuse me, 13 through 18. Now Adonijah, the son of Haggith, came to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon. So she said, You come peaceably? And he said, Peaceably. Moreover, he said, I have something to say to you. And she said, Say it. And he said, You know that the kingdom was mine, and all Israel had set their expectation on me that I should reign. However, the kingdom has been turned over, and has become my brother's, for it was his from the Lord. Now I ask just one petition of you. Do not deny me. And she said to him, Say it. Then he said, Please speak to King Solomon, for he will not refuse you, that he may give me Abishag the Shunammite as wife. So, what's Adonijah trying to do here? Get the kingdom back. Get the kingdom back. Abishag, at this point, is part of the household of Solomon. The new king always inherited all the concubines and all the wives of the previous king. It's part of the household that Solomon inherits from his father. Now, he doesn't really have... Now, Adonijah really doesn't have any more access to Solomon than he had access to King David. So he asked Bathsheba to ask Solomon if he could have Abishag. Adonijah's request renews his efforts to lay claim on the kingdom because Abishag is the king's bride. He wants to seize the bride of Israel that Solomon now protects. So in asking for Abishag, he's asking for the kingdom. And Bathsheba says, Very well, I will speak for you to the king. Now some consider at this particular point Bathsheba either naive or perhaps jealous or some other such nonsense. But in reality she is very shrewd. She is very shrewd. She understands perfectly the custom of inheriting the previous king's harem and what is at stake. She knows what Adonijah is up to. And in the Hebrew it's it's much clearer. She does not say that she would speak to Solomon on his behalf, but I will speak to Solomon about you. I will go and speak to Solomon about you, if that's what you want. (laughs) Are you sure you want me to speak to Solomon about you? He says, yeah. So King Solomon answered and said to his mother in verse uh, 22b, Now why do you ask Abishag, the Shudamite of Adonijah? Ask for him the kingdom also, for he is my older brother for him and for Abiathar the priest and for Joab the son of Zariah. Then King Solomon swore by the Lord saying, My God, do so to me and more also if Adonijah has not spoken this word against his own life. So King Solomon answered his mother, Now why do you ask for Abishag the Shunammite for Adonijah? Bathsheba knew exactly what she was doing. She knew that Adonijah was asking for the kingdom and Solomon sees it very clearly. And King Solomon, as part of establishing the kingdom, strikes Adonijah down, verse, verse 25. So King Solomon 
sent by the hand of Benaniah, the son of Jehoiada, and struck him down, and he died. It's part of establishing the kingdom. There's this violence that's going on because it's a creative act. He does what the first Adam never did. He kills the serpent. He's protecting the garden. Now, Joab and Abiathar are also implicated, we read, in the plot. And Solomon sets about protecting the house of David. Abiathar, the priest, he treats gently, and he just exiles him to Anathoth in in 2.26. He says, you are a man of death, but I will not put you to death. But he exiles him. And Joab hears of this, and, and like Adonijah earlier, Joab flees to the horn of the altar, thinking he's going to have safety there. But then when he refuses to come down from the altar, Solomon has him struck down. Again, violence in this creative act. He has shed the blood of war and peace, and has slain Abner, we've read, and the commander, the commander of the army of Israel, and Amasa, the commander of the army of Judah. So Joab had brought blood guiltiness on the house of Israel. We see that in Deuteronomy, shedding the blood of innocence. And with Solomon's order, Yahweh really returns his blood on his own head. Verse 32 and 33. So the Lord will return his blood on his head because he struck down the two men more righteous and better than he. And he killed them with the sword. Verse 33, Their blood shall therefore return upon the head of Joab and upon the head of his descendants forever. But upon David and his descendants, upon his house and his throne, there shall be peace forever from the Lord. Solomon's establishing peace in the kingdom. And Yahweh returns the blood of Joab back on his own head. Joab's execution is a a cleansing sacrifice that saves Solomon from the consequence of Joab's sin because there was blood guiltiness on the house of Israel. He says there shall be peace forever. Well, we're not done. We still have Chief Justice John Roberts to get rid of and Shammai. Shammai's offense was, was cursing David by calling down Saul's blood on his head. We read that in the first part of of Kings. And Yahweh has returned upon you all the blood of the house of Saul was the curse. And Solomon performed a double turning here as well. The blood that Shammai uh, hoped that would turn on David is turned back on his head. We see that in verse 44. The king said moreover to Shammai, You know as your heart acknowledges all the wickedness that you did to my father David. Therefore the Lord will return your wickedness on your own head. It's a turning back on their own head. But Solomon puts Shammai under house arrest rather than execute him right away. He shows mercy. He confines him to Jerusalem and Jerusalem then becomes a city of refuge. But he tells him, you leave Jerusalem, you die. You got that? Shammai says, yes, I understand that. Two of Shammai's slaves, however, escape. And they escape to the city of Achish. Now that's important. They uh, escape to Achish, the the king of Gath. Now that's where David found refuge from his flight from Saul, interestingly enough. Shammai pursues them. So what's he do? He leaves Jerusalem. What's going to happen to Shammai? He's going to die. He pursues these two slaves, just like Saul pursued David, and Solomon has Shammai executed. Verse 44. Shammai? You leave, you die. And the wickedness is returned on the head of Shammai. Again, there's a double turning there. So there's violence 
involved in this creative act of establishing the garden house of Israel. And so we have a picture of Solomon imitating the creator, Yahweh, in establishing the kingdom. Violence is a part of the creation of the original garden, and it is certainly part of the creative act of establishing Israel as a garden land. Now many Christians today believe that really creation came into being through a peaceful act of, of giving through speech and that all things came into being by a perfectly loving, perfectly peaceful communion of Father, Son, and Spirit. Well, it was perfectly loving and there was perfect communion. But as to its peacefulness, the scriptures seem to say something entirely different. And the same is true as in the final kingdom, in the new heavens, in the new earth. Indeed, it was established by perfect love, perfect communion. But unless you can convince me that Revelation 18 or Revelation 19 is a perfectly peaceful scene, the kingdom of God comes with violence. Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no one knew except himself. He, he was clothed with a robe dripped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it he should strike the nation, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. And he had on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Love, love, love. That is not a group hug. Violent execution of justice is the means for establishing conditions of a new creation. Why? So that peace may flourish. So that the land can be a rest. As one theologian put it, divine violence is the way in which God strives toward a situation of pure hospitality. When you first read that, it catches you. <laughs> divine violence is the way in which God strives toward a situation of pure hospitality. Their peace must be established. And so Solomon serves as the minister of wrath. Romans 13.4 That's the function of government to establish peace. Period. To establish an Israel and, and, and Solomon serves as a minister of wrath. Why? To establish an Israel that is a, a preview, a foreshadowing of of the continual rejoicing and, and pure hospitality of the kingdom under the new Solomon, the last Adam, Jesus Christ. And we must keep in mind that the violent establishment of the kingdom under Solomon is but a faint shadow of the greater Solomon who establishes a new creation. First of all, by suffering violence rather than deploying it. The violence was exhibited on the Son of God, on Jesus himself, first of all. But as Jesus yielded up his spirit, one last cry in Matthew, we see what? That the veil was rent. There's a rending again. That the veil was rent and what? And the rocks were split. There's a 
splitting of the rocks again. And the chief priest should have been saying, uh oh. Doive. Or was it Yahweh? Yahweh. The earth is violently broken and judgment is near. A Christ who only suffers violence, and that's how many people have Christ today, that he's only a Christ that suffered violence. But if you only have a Christ who suffers violence, he's not the Christ of the New Testament. The Christ of Revelation is no passive victim of violence. And one last thing. And David uh, tells Solomon to reward Barzillai, the Gilead, who fed David when he fled Jerusalem during the rebellion of Absalom. That's in David's instructions to Solomon. But show kindness to the sons of Barzillai, the Gilead, and let them be among those who eat at your table. For so they came to me when I fled from Absalom, your brother. So we see they're to be a witness to the nations. And here we have it. Israel being a witness to the nations and they're invited to the table. David's instructions. Barzillai Bless the Lord's anointed, the true Abrahamic seed, and in return, he's going to receive a blessing, like the Gentiles. Now, executing enemies is not the ultimate aim of establishing the kingdom, or any political action, for that matter. It's not the ultimate aim. Nor is the violence designed merely to establish power, and exercise control and maintain some type of degree of order. We see that failing around the world, if that's all that is. Enemies must be removed in order to open space for a table. For a table. Psalm 23. Fear must be eliminated in order to give place to joy. The boundaries of the kingdom must be secured. That's what you see in Genesis. That's what you see in Job. That's what you see in Psalm 104. In that creation language. What? Boundaries are being established and made secure. The sea can go no further. I have set my bars here. So the boundaries of the kingdom must be secured so that the people of the kingdom can eat and drink and rejoice before the Lord. And Solomon executes the enemies of the kingdoms so that the friends of the kingdom can eat and drink and enjoy peace and prosperity and security. In verse 7 he says, Show kindness to the sons of Barzillai. Let them be among those who eat at your table, Peter. You see, for Solomon, as well as for Jesus, the table is really the heart of the kingdom. And being able to eat at that table in peace. But in order for there to be peace at the table, violence must proceed, precede it. In the tabernacle, as in Solomon's temple, where was the table set? Outside the Holy of Holies. The table was set outside the Holy of Holies. And separated by what? A veil. A veil. Exodus 26, 35. It set the table outside the veil. But in the new creation... Violence is done. To who? The king of kings. The rock split. 
And what? The veil is rent from top to bottom. That is his flesh. Hebrews 10, 20. And now there is no veil between the table and the Holy of Holies. Therefore, brethren, having boldness, confidence, let us enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Let us enter by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the violence of the rent veil that is his flesh. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. We now have table fellowship in its fullest. There is no longer a veil separating the table from the Holy of Holies. And we have fellowship to its fullest extent.